Well, we're going to take a slice of Matthew tonight and uh, and just try to practice reading closely and noticing some connections uh, between sections of Scripture. And I'll just try to point these out as we go along. And uh, I, I really do hope it's interesting and uh, and edifying to you. So let me do this. Okay. Before I do, since we're going to read, uh, Joni sent out the email with uh, the scripture reference from Matthew 13 and 14. We're going to, I won't, I won't have us read it as a whole, but we will look at that. But before I do, since we're smack in the middle of the book of Matthew, I thought using uh, an outline, and this is just one, an outline of the whole book from R.T. France's commentary on Matthew, which is in the New Test, the New International Commentary on the New Testament series. R.T. France is a, a British scholar. So we'll look at the references here, and then we'll look at how he outlines the whole book. And of course, uh, as I've said at other times, scholars vary to some degree. Sometimes the outlines run pretty close together. Sometimes there's quite a bit of diversity in how the scholars see the themes of these books. And I'm just using this one as, as a, a sample, you might say. So the opening section, he says, introduces the Messiah. So that gets us up to about the time of uh, Jesus' temptation, right? So it includes the genealogy and the and the story of Joseph having the interaction with the angel, baby's born, they go to, you know, the Magi come. They go to Egypt, they come back from Egypt, all that. John the Baptist, so on. Then in the next section, that goes, it's a big section, 412 through 1620. So that's the section we're going to be reading within tonight. And notice that he uses the word the Messiah in each of these uh, statements. So the, the section we're looking at tonight in, uh, is in the Messiah revealed in word and deed. Now, I frankly, I think that's a little bit too generic. I mean, you can say that about a lot of different sections of various Gospels. Uh, but, but that's what I'd like to try to show tonight as we as we read these, these uh, sections of Scripture that on a surface level look like they don't necessarily have any connection to each other. And France actually says there's a little bit of you know, it's like these separate stories and sayings of Jesus are just kind of set down in us in 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 not necessarily a um, in, in any way that shows the connections between them. I think we can see connections. Uh, I'll get back to that. Then the next section. So I'm on number three now from Galilee to Jerusalem, the Messiah and his followers prepare for the confrontation. So this is the. You know, who do people say that I am? You're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus starts talking about his death. They're on their way to Jerusalem. And then the next section, number four, is in Jerusalem. So it starts with the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, chapter 21, verse 1. And uh, you get basically four chapters of confrontation with the religious leaders. And then number five, chapter 26, through 2815 is is death and resurrection. That's what vindicated means here. So he's vindicated by the resurrection. And then the last section, which is only five verses, is the mess messianic mission is launched. So the word Messiah appears. So France is saying two things with the use of the word Messiah. Number one, and this many scholars widely agree that that all of the Gospels are lifting up a picture of Christ as God's anointed. And, and Matthew being, so to speak, the most Jewish of the Gospels, uh, uh, really is showing, and that's why the, the genealogy in chapter 1, for example, is really showing that Christ is the king of Israel. Yeah, but he's more than just the king of Israel. So that's we're, we're going to get into a little taste of that tonight. So that's 
This, this outline is just one example of an outline that, that you could follow. So that helps us to begin to get a handle a little bit on how the book of Matthew is structured. And that's always helpful when you're wading into this material that often is not that familiar to us. Now, one more thing I'd like to show is that Matthew uh, has these five sections that you can see if you have a Bible that puts the words of Jesus in red. You can see it very clearly. So Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 10 is, uh, is guidance for the mission of the 12. When Jesus sends out the 12, he teaches them there, instructs them. Matthew 13, the kingdom parables. We're going to do a little bit of that tonight. Uh, and then Matthew 18, it's about greatness in the kingdom. And then that there's a section on forgiveness. So it looks like greatness in the kingdom is related to the way we relate to one another. And then finally, the last big discourse section is the temple destruction and judgment of the nations in Matthew 24 and 25. Now, what is not obvious to us unless we were to dig into it and if we had a one of those uh, gospel parallel type books where Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are laid out in parallel columns, we would see then that that there are similar characteristics in Mark and Luke, but just reading through Mark and Luke don't necessarily see it as clearly as you do in Matthew. All right, that's just all background. Um, now let's turn to our reading for the night. So chapter 13, starting with verse 24. Hopefully you've had a chance to read, but if you if you look, and we could have done we could have done 13 1, right? Because the parables of the kingdom start at the beginning, but I was trying to shorten it a little bit. So 13:24. Notice where it says the kingdom of heaven is like now I, that's i'm quoting from my new revised standard your version if you use a different version is pretty close to that mm -hmm. let's let's just state where we see that phrase or clause the kingdom of heaven is like so obviously verse 24 where else do you see it 31 okay 31 33 33 yeah. Forty-four, forty-four, 44. And, 40, and forty-five, and forty-six, or forty-seven. 45, uh huh. Forty-five, and then forty-seven, and that's it. All right. Now, what I'd like to do is we're going to spend a little time here looking at these kingdom parables, and without reading them all, can we? examine the themes and by theme i mean what's the subject matter of each of these statements or parables so the kingdom of heaven is like what again i'm asking you to sort of state the obvious but it's always good to state the obvious so what are they someone who sowed seeds okay so seeds sown in a field and then what happens it grows. And, and yeah, so an enemy comes in and sows tares among the wheat. All right. Okay, we got that. Then what happens at the end of that parable? The harvest. The harvest. All right. Let's go to the next kingdom parable. Verse 31. Mustard seed. Okay, a mustard seed. Turns into a big shrub of some kind. What happens? <coughs> Birds nest in it. Birds nest in it. Now, I've read this lots of times. And of course, I'm, you know, sort of shaped by other thoughts. I'm thinking this is like a picture of evangelism. You know, the kingdom of God where all these birds come. And well, that's it's true, but there's more to the picture. Well, I think it's true. There's more to the picture of that. What? Than that we'll come back though okay so that's so we have a mustard seed that grows into a tree how about the next one oh what's the what's the, sort of the end end point of that saying then birds the bird, uh, yes okay so birds nesting in this tree all right 
out of small great things come. Yeah, so that's a, that could be a theme uh, or a, a principle you might say that we would derive. All right, good. Let's go to the yeast. Oh, I know all about that. <laughs> <laughs> Speak, Billy. <laughs> How many rolls did you make today? Uh, 36 dozen, I believe. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Okay, well, what's that about? What what what's the what are some of the details of that saying? Well, she works the yeast into the dough, and then it rises and and expands and makes bigger. Okay, and the outcome? It grows. All, all of it was leavened. Yeah, the yeast doesn't work its work until all is leavened. Okay, good. Then the next one, verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like? A treasure hidden in a field. Uh-huh, and what's the outcome here? Someone sells everything to buy the field. Okay, a kind of all in. I'm going all in on this one thing. Okay, how about the pearl then? Same thing. Same thing, yeah. Same thing. Okay, and then we'll do the kingdom of heaven is like a net. What happens there? It's kind of back, it. Yeah, it's kind of like the back to the beginning where mm -hmm. you have the different fish and they're separating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the bad fish it's are thrown away. Fish of every kind. Uh -huh. mine yeah. says. Right. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to us? Fish yeah. of every kind. Right. It is, it's an interesting kind of a, a feature of the saying that raises that, that sort of question. Okay, let me throw up some things here. So what is, what is held in common? You have you have these two sets of parables grouped into three, and they do have, um, I think we can say they, they uh, boil down is not right, that's probably too far, but into two major themes. But we have a beginning and an ending that, that Larry noticed there. So in the weeds and wheat parable, the weeds, the tares are gathered and bundled and burned. And if you look at the bad fish outcome, there's a furnace, right? A furnace of fire, it says in my version. Mm -hmm. So you throw the, the unrighteous, right? The bad fish into the furnace of fire. The angels just. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Now then in between, <clears throat> the mustard seed and the shrub. So let me uh, let me go ahead and move forward. I have a picture of a tree there that I think is hmm. uh, that is a mustard tree. So it's pretty big and bushy, right? A lot of birds could nest in that tree. And I I think this is a. I think that's a, a tree in, in the Galilee. I think that's a picture of a tree in actually in Israel. So, all right. Probably enjoying that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you all can disagree with, with me on this if you if you think I got this wrong, but. <laughs> Uh, we have the we have the fully grown tree that there's a kind of end end goal that's like the harvest. So when the when the when the crop is ready, when it's ripe, fully grown, then there's a harvest. So you've got a kind of end vision of what the outcome should be with yeast. You've got the end, the end vision there is the, the, the whole lump is leavened. The yeast keeps working until all is leavened. And here's an interesting question. I think it's interesting. 
Why the exact amount? I don't know how your version reads, but mine says a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. I don't exact. I didn't check this. I don't exactly know what a measure, how much a measure is. Does your version say something different that may give, that may give us a Sorry, 22 liters, a half a bushel or 22 so liters. So a measure is a half a bushel. Three sappers. I don't know if that's total or each one. Well, we you know we don't have to get the amount exactly right, but let's just say that three measures that would be a bushel and a half of dough, flour, flour. Sorry, flour. It's a lot how, of flour. How much, how much bread would a bushel and a half of flour make? A lot. Billy, <laughs> I don't know, but I can tell you how much twenty five pounds of flour makes. <laughs> okay, how many pounds of flour are, are in a bushel? Who knows? Bushel. Is, is well, I, I, I don't know, but if you think about the content, a bag, a big bag of probably 25 pound bag of flour would probably almost fill a bushel basket. Okay, yeah. 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 Well, the point here is, so what, you know, it sort of slows us down. Why, why does Jesus actually name three measures? Is there something significant about the number? Yes. Could be. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but 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 also that's a lot of flour. Why? Well, so again, well, the, I don't know. I don't know anything about. Uh, tree too. <laughs> sorry, the mustard tree is a big tree too. Right, it's a good sized tree that starts small. Mm -hmm. Right, so you take a little bit of leavening, and. It, Again, as I understand it, the leavening comes from a, an old lump of dough. You keep a little bit from the old lump and you you put it in the, the new dough that you want leavened. A starter. So, it, yeah, a starter, right? So it's just a little bit into this big amount. So that's that kind of parallels this little seed that becomes a sizable tree. Okay, then we switch. We'll come back, but we switch to this notion of kind of selling all. So we have we have one and then the second and the third that that roughly par they parallel the the idea of the harvest or the completion of the process. Okay? And then we have this sell all idea. Uh, this all-in idea, and then we go back to uh, a, a vision of of, of uh, separating and judging. So th these th these these sayings of Jesus bookend final judgment of some kind. But all of the parables, in one way or another, envision the product the outcome, the sorting out, the whatever, right? Um, or the value of the kingdom, because everyone starts with the kingdom is like, okay, this is me just rolling the ball out now. So what, as we've talked this out a little bit, what do you notice or what does this help you think about? Any thoughts? Do you think these two about the selling all has anything to do that we are to give up and, and be totally in? Yes, I, I think so. In other words, the kingdom is of such great value that it's really worth everything to us. Yeah. So it's sort of what is it? What is it worth? I know I'm not going to quote it right for a man to save his life and lose his soul kind of thing. Gain the world. Gain the world. Gain the world and lose his soul. There we yeah. Go. yeah. Right. That kind of all in. Yeah. The other thing that the mustard seed and shrub and yeast talk of, or allude to is a process that is beyond control of the one who starts it. 
I mean, you can plant the mustard seed, but then this humongous thing, it's like the, the one, the, the one, the 10, the 100, oh, mm -hmm. that process, kingdom, that's beyond us. Yeah. So in terms of our participation, we're not talking about the judgment now, but the yeah. all-in thing, yeah. seeing that the kingdom is like that, in order to participate, in order to be there, we have to be, we were called to be all-in. Right, right. And it's valuable enough that being all in is the mm -hmm. right move to make. Uh, okay, well, I mentioned the mustard seed thing, and, and here's, so the birds nesting in the branches. Let's go to Daniel chapter four. I don't know why that extra parenthesis mark is in there. I know some gremlin did this. I did not do that. <laughs> so Daniel four, 10 through 12. Now, we won't read the context here. It's a, it's one of Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. So Daniel is going to interpret this dream. But the, the specifically relevant part we find in 10 through 12. Upon my bed, this is what I saw. There was a tree at the center of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew great and strong. Its top reached to heaven, and it was visible to the ends of the whole earth. Its foliage was beautiful, its fruit abundant, and it provided food for all. The animals of the field found shade under it. The birds of the air nested in its branches, and from it all living beings were fed. Now, what do we know about King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire that might relate to this picture. It was a very rich empire, very mighty and beautiful. And big, and, and it was in that part of the world, the world dominant nation, kingdom. And they brought the best from when the spoils of war, they brought the best back. That's right. We had a yes. great garden. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So here's a picture in, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream of he's kind of the top dog, right? He's the king over all kings. Okay, so here we go back to Matthew 13, and Matthew uh, catches Jesus Saying something about the kingdom. What's he saying, do you think? Chop down the tree. <laughs> <laughs> well, he does say that with the, 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 the olive tree that's not, or the fig tree that's not bearing fruit. But... Well, my Bible says for this one. The whole really? the holy what, what is your... from heaven said, chop down the tree and top off its branch, lop off its branches. That's in Daniel. Oh yeah, Daniel. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah, I was yeah. I forgive me. I I'm, I'm moving back to Matthew now. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So so in Matthew 13, Jesus is telling us about this image of the of the tree starts little, gets big. What what might Jesus be saying here? Might Jesus be alluding to the book of Daniel? What would he be saying? Well, let me let me put it like this. Jesus is saying, don't be fooled by all the glitz and glamour of the big shot kingdoms. And they're pounding on their chests and telling us all how great and powerful they are. God, the kingdom of heaven, God's kingdom, starts little. It's pretty, pretty modest. You don't really notice it. But when it's all said and done, the birds of the air come and nest in its branches, right? So that, that same vision of this kind of overarching domain, reign, where, where the nations are coming, 
Jesus is saying, there's the kingdom. That's the kingdom that you need to worry about, that you need to care about. It's the kingdom of heaven. And he doesn't name Nebuchadnezzar. He doesn't say, according to Daniel 4, he doesn't say anything like that. But it, is it an allusion to a mighty king, a mighty king yeah. who thinks he's all that? Well, you also have, this is a guess, mm -hmm. the tree of knowledge and good and evil. A tree, I'm just thinking trees. Sure, yeah. The tree of crucifixion. Sure, yeah. And the tree beside the water in a revelation mm -hmm. that feeds the nation. Yeah. Can everybody hear online? Can you hear her? Yeah. Can you? Okay, good. All right. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at this tree, I mean that's to me when you when you're talking about the when I read the tree in Daniel, I think, well, that's nothing. Go back here to the revelation. <laughs> yeah. So here's a good example. I mean, Joanne is giving us an example of, of this word association. And that's a fruitful exploration, right? And we're going to hit a few dead ends, and we're going to find some really incredible insights doing that. Yeah. But here, tonight, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, the other image that I'm seeing is there. the birds are coming to the tree to nest. They aren't necessarily coming to feed. It's their choice, but by nesting or making their home there, there's a reason that they've chosen that tree. Right. Yeah, I, I think that home, you know, the, the belonging part of it, having a home. Uh, security. Security, yeah. And there's a psalm. I'm. It's one of the psalms in the 80s. It talks about the sparrow finding a home really in the Lord's temple, mm -hmm. right? And that's an amazing thing. So this little sparrow that, there are gajillions of sparrows around, right? That the sparrow finds her home in the presence of the Lord in the temple. That goes along with at least what, what I understand you to be saying, Jim, that mm -hmm. in the tree, there's a nest, there's a place to be where, where that bird belongs. And I do think that's a good picture of the kingdom that, G that Jesus and the book of Matthew is showing. Okay, now this was all preparation. So what we're focused on here is the kingdom. And Matthew has, so to speak, plopped these kingdom sayings down in the middle of these other events, stories, accounts that he's narrating. We have the kingdom. Now we're not going to do everything and all these, you know, we're going to, I'm going to skip over. For example, I'm skipping over the, the the scribe of the kingdom bringing out treasures old and new. We could do stuff with that. But then he tells, Matthew tells the story about Jesus going to his hometown in Nazareth. What do you think, what do you think is the relationship here, if any? I don't know if I, I I don't know if this answered your question, but the 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 descriptions that we've seen earlier of the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, it's there. They are um, since they're parables or their picture images, you know, of what the kingdom is. It's like you can't see the kingdom by looking straight at it you can only see it in your peripheral vision <laughs> and i i feel a little bit like that's when jesus goes then to nazareth and like you can't see the kingdom in the sin in the same way that you want to that we ought to be able to look at things and see them you have to see it yeah or the way I find following the way I would say it, so it makes me think of the one who has eyes to see, mm -hmm. let him or her see, right? Mm -hmm. If you just look at 
the surface level data and use a kind of conventional way of understanding, you might miss it. Or more to the point, if your heart is resistant to what God is doing, you might miss this. You might not see it. Well, and even in those parables where where the kingdom grows without humans, there is a human participation at the beginning. And their lack of faith was it prohibited or they just didn't plant the seed or plant the weed, whatever. Right. They didn't do that. Yeah. So there is a participation, although it right. being small, mm -hmm. yeah. that our faith. Absolutely. So yeah, God God is doing this, right? This is God's kingdom and he's going to do it. But there is a human role in it. And and we can we can respond in faith or we can harden our hearts and miss it. Yeah. People didn't think that someone from their hometown could possibly be the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And I think that just shows how many people in this world will not accept Jesus because they just don't think that's right. They just think that's just a fairy tale yeah. or something. Yeah. 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 He doesn't fit our profile, uh, our envision, our vision of what a great, a great person would do, would be or do. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it, it is, how does, how does that little part about Jesus and Nazareth conclude? Didn't do anything there. Yeah, he left. Did he ever return? Yeah, there's. that's a good question. We don't know. In the narratives of the gospel, he doesn't ever go back to Nazareth. Uh, now, Mark, Mark's version of this story says that Jesus couldn't do any miracles there except heal a few people, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. which, which always makes me laugh. Yeah. But here, Matthew says he could not do many deeds of power. So apparently he could do some because of their unbelief. So it's kind of a self-fulfilling outcome, right? They don't, they, they disrespect Jesus because he's a local boy. They don't recognize him as what? What is it that they don't, they don't recognize? Messiah. That, that seems to be the suggestion, right? Even though it doesn't say it exactly. Again, in Luke chapter 4, where this account comes up, it's very clear. He reads from the scroll of Isaiah chapter 61. And then Jesus says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. It doesn't say that here, but it seems to be the same kind of attitude. Yeah. They're not buying that Jesus is the king. Because that's what the word Messiah means, right? The anointed one, the coming king. I always thought about this one as, you know, when he's he's back in the town where he grew up, it's also they're, they're, it's almost like they're contemptible towards him due to familiarity. Right. You know, he's he's the three year old kid that they saw throwing rocks with his other friends or taking a pee in the field or something like that. How could you possibly be the Messiah? Right. You know, we saw you as a growing up as a child. So, yeah. Just, and we just, know all your just, brothers and sisters. Right. Does jealousy figure in on that same sort of line of thought? What's that? Does jealousy figure in on that same line of thought that Larry had? Oh, maybe. Jealousy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He went out, you know, he's made a name for himself versus, you know, yeah. now he comes back, etc. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that is interesting, right? Because Jesus has done some pretty amazing things. I, to me, the word resentment maybe gets a little closer than jealousy. Because okay. uh, surely they knew what Jesus was doing. Because it's, you know, it's just down the road, not not that far, uh, a, a good day's journey probably from Nazareth down to Capernaum, for example. But yeah, they would have they would have heard stories about Jesus, but they don't believe it. Now Okay, I'll I'll, I'll save that because uh, we're, we're going to get to the second. Yes, ma'am. Uh, don't you think, though, that 
life is still that way. I mean, I can think of some times when uh, people from the local area have, for example, been pretty ornery up through high school and college and then became pastors somewhere. And people are saying, oh, really? Can you believe that? You know, I mean, yeah. and they'll come back home to do it. And, and actually, just a few years ago, I was uh, visiting with some young men who had come back to um, for a weekend, and they were former students of mine. And this one guy says, um, well, right now I'm a youth pastor. I'll bet you never thought I'd be something like yeah. that. Did you? You know? <laughs> so, I mean, I think that played into it, too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, my dad was like that. He was a pretty ornery kid. I was a young teenager, uh, and we 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 were in we went to Ashland, Kansas, and we we're downtown in the afternoon. And Ashland used to have a soda fountain in the drugstore, and so we had stopped there to you know get a drink and got out of the car. And this guy walked by, and he looked at my dad, and he said, "Well, Skunk Rankin, what are you doing here?" <laughs> well, I had never heard anybody call my dad Skunk, and of course, my dad was a Methodist preacher. Uh, <laughs> So you can imagine me, you know, I'm like 13, 14 years old. Okay, dad, what's this skunk stuff about? Well, dad had been a pretty hungry kid. And one day on the way to school, they rode horses to school from where he lived. They found a dead skunk and he took it and he put it in the, the, the furnace, you know, the boiler, <laughs> you know, radiator. Oh, yeah. they, had to, they had to let school out because he, you know, it just destroyed the, anyway, skunk Rankin. <laughs> okay, back to back to the kingdom. <laughs> so I put these two words on the screen here. Time. If we go back and think about those parables, the kingdom's going to take some time. And it does seem to be that as Jesus works with his disciples, and as we read, if we were to read chapters 24 and 5, where Jesus gets into what we could say are some of the end times scenarios or the destruction of the temple and all that uh, time. Don't be fooled by the loudest voices, the people who say, here I am, you know, this is it. So time and patience and a willingness to kind of go day by day and not be fooled. And then sides, this goes along, right? Little, unknown, seemingly inconsequential. So let's go to Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah, who's one of the, one of the prophets that uh, prophesies about the rebuilding of the temple after the Babylonian exile. So Zechariah uh, chapter 4, verse 10. So my version says, for whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice. And some versions put that more in like the imperative. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. So we, we don't look down our noses on small things when they're getting started, because you just never know. And going back to the kingdom parables, the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven starts small. But look where it goes. Look what happens at the outcome, at the end of all things. Hey, uh, Steve. Yeah. <clears throat> so related to the you know the small the the yeast in a measure of uh, flour. <clears throat> the if you have like if you have live yeast in flour, uh, and you give it enough time, I mean, really just a teeny tiny bit of yeast. In terms of like like um. Uh, like the sourdough, like a sourdough starter, just a little teeny <laughs> tiny bit of it, if you're willing to wait for days, will eventually rise, you know, it'll eventually it, it rise. Do the whole work. Yeah. yeah, yeah, which is, and since we use um, active, you know, we use active starter, and so we're used to, when we make bread, 
you know, you can get it, you can get bread to rise in a couple of hours and it's ready to bake. Yeah. Um, and so it's hard to grasp that the yeah. time involved, you might just have to wait a really, really, really long time. Yeah. But if the if the yeast is good, uh, it will eventually permeate the whole thing. Right. We probably could we turn off one of these heaters? Mm -hmm. Is anybody is it Steffi? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, I think it's Steffi in here. So okay. All right. Well then let's think about we're gonna we're gonna move on now. Um uh, let's think about I'm asking us to think about the placement of these sayings and stories, the placement. And can we see maybe some what what is in the mind of Matthew for putting these sort of next to each other? So what comes after the story of the unbelief of the uh, people in Nazareth? What's next? It didn't happen next, but it's recounted there as the beheading of John. Yeah, so see? Okay. Th this is out of order chronologically. Why does he put it here? And let's go back to Matthew chapter 4. Verse 12. Results for NASA. Matthew 4, verse 12 says, Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. Um, Matthew, let's see. I got to get my Matthew 14, 13. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew. So when Jesus heard what? That John had been killed. So there's a link between uh, events here. Jesus starts his ministry when John is arrested. Jesus does something in chapter 14 when he hears that John has been executed. What does he do? Right. Now let's just take a second and, and speculate here a little bit. Just kind of think out loud. So Jesus hears that John the Baptist has been executed and he does what? He goes to a deserted place. Which, by the way, in the in the geography, so Herod is the king. He's the he's the tetrarch. King is the wrong word to use. Sorry, he's the tetrarch. He's the ruler of Galilee, and uh, boy, my mind just went blank. Perea, and these are two territories that aren't uh, contiguous. They're not adjacent to each other. In between is the Decapolis and other, it's controlled by other leaders. So you could be in Galilee and uh, the Tetrarch Herod would be in Tiberias, which is down on the southwest kind of part of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus is just around. He basically just crosses over a little bit from like Capernaum, Bethsaida, and he's into territory that's not controlled by, by Herod. So that may be the deserted place. And we can imagine the like where the Sermon on the Mount is traditionally thought to have been delivered and all that. So kind of the northeast corner of the Sea of Galilee up there in the hills. Okay. Why does he withdraw when he hears this? Thinking maybe his life might be threatened. Okay. Dad, that's his cousin. But, yeah, but we're going to... Could be Go grieving. Ahead. Could be grieving. Good. Now that's good. Okay, this is good. This is good practice. So Matthew has been showing Jesus talking about the kingdom of heaven. We get we get the disbelief as a, of his hometown people. We get Herod, the ruler, exercising power like they did. We get Jesus withdrawing, but he's been talking about the kingdom. And what's going to happen in chapter 16? Mm 
Well, that's where he, I don't think it says it there, but that's where he takes them up to Caesarea Philippi and says, who do you say I am? Yep. You are the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. Yeah. And what does Jesus start doing then once, once that declaration has been made? And he says, you don't know what you're saying. Yeah, because he starts telling him he's going to Jerusalem and he's going to suffer and die. So we get, if we keep reading, we get the sense that Jesus knows already he's going to die. So back here in 14, is he leaving? Is he going to a deserted place? Maybe to avoid death? Maybe that's where he found out the, what the rest of the story was going to be. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think he's yeah, just he thinking knows. about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's you've got to give yourself some time to realize what's going to happen. Yeah, okay. All right, well, let's, let's keep stirring the pot here a little bit and go on and notice what happens then when he withdraws. Yeah. He gets followed. Yeah. By a whole bunch of people. And, and what does he do? He, he feeds them, takes yeah. care of them. Heals them, gives them what they need. <laughs> okay. What is a in in ancient times? What was the king supposed to do? Take care of the people. Provide yeah. for his people, right? Particularly the Jew, the Israelite king. The Israelite king is a shepherd because God, the God of Israel, is a shepherd. A shepherd takes care of the sheep. So here's Jesus. Okay, well, there's more we can do there. All right. And then what does he do? He feeds them supper. Yeah, okay. And then after that, what's the next event? Where, where Peter walks on the water. Yeah. And that's because Jesus is walking on the water. Mm -hmm. Okay. So to speak, taking a step back and look, what is what is Matthew showing us about Jesus in chapter 14? That he's like the kingdom of heaven <laughs> going about his work. <laughs> okay. Yeah. He's, I mean, he's, he's like He's not the kingdom. He's the king. Yeah. Yeah. Very compassionate. Okay. okay. Yeah. But I guess I was thinking in terms of uh, the the maybe it's not the small not maybe it's not small things, but it's a different way. It's a different way than that um, kingship and kingdoms yeah. and power and is looks normally looks or is you know. Looks He's to the acting world. the opposite of Herod. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. The true king does not rule like earthly kings. So, you know, there's a little bit of sarcasm in the description of Herod. Herod gets manipulated, yep. you know, in a drunken party. He gets manipulated by a pretty girl. <laughs> and he does something he doesn't really want to do. He doesn't he doesn't really want to cut off John the Baptist's head, but he's got to save face among all of his peers. But see, that even by doing that, we've talked about this. This was a true honor shame picture. I mean, mm -hmm. he shamed himself. He allowed himself to be controlled by this little girl. Yeah. And by the crowd. I mean, he's supposed to be the king. Yeah. Right. He shouldn't be swayed by these. Whoever right. the plebeians or whoever's around yeah. him, but he allowed himself to that. Right. And so, so what? What was you know? One of the themes we're working on here is we're watching the exercise of power by a, by an earthly ruler in contrast with the king, the Messiah. Right. The this is God's representative. Uh, he doesn't exercise power that way. But there's, but if we sort of, you know, take the 30,000 foot view, then Jesus walking on the water, that's a, that's a different sort of miracle. It goes along with hushing the storm, calming the sea. Mm -hmm. It's a nature miracle. 
the food distribution would also be a nature miracle, I think. It's not like healing or casting out a demon where that's doing something to free a person. No, this, this shows if Jesus is walking on the water, then, then the power of Almighty God himself is present in this man. So if we go back to, well, why does he go to this deserted place when he hears about John the Baptist's death? Is he, is he kind of turning tail and running? It doesn't, you know, when we look at the bigger context here, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like that's a good conclusion. He chooses to go to Jerusalem. I mean, it's very focused, the whole lap as half of Matthew. In Mark, we see that that's his choice. He's, he scheduled it. He goes, his, I mean, he was going against his, his friends, his disciples, but he chose that every step of the way. Right, he right. He was in control. He was in control along the water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in John, you know, Jesus, in, in John, Jesus says, it's not my time, right? So it, it looks it looks like from this bigger context uh, picture that that Jesus may very well be managing the confrontation. He knows the confrontation is coming. He doesn't fear it the way we might think of fear, but he does know that there's a time for it. This is not the time for it. Yeah. Are, are you you're, are you still referring to the going away by himself? The like, going to a deserted, deserted place. place. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I would I guess, think there was some prayer involved in that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think of the, you, you know, because so he's also human. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you, you know, you, you, John the Baptist is put to death and, you know, he knows, he knows what's coming for him. You know, he, there's, there's, it's almost like, the ball is now rolling. Uh, it's accelerating. It's, yes, things are accelerating, right. and my doom is, you know, is near. And and even things like, um, you know, maybe he prayed for the cup, but you know, similar yeah. to the prayer in Gethsemane, or you know, maybe he prayed for courage to do what it was that was ahead of him. You know, right. just. All the kind of things that you need when you see what's going on right. and you need the father's right. You need to be with the father. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. I, I think that's fair. And I think it's worthy of reflection. I don't think Matthew necessarily wants us to follow that line of thinking. It's a legitimate way, you know, it's a legitimate line of thinking. But if if we keep the kingdom really present in our thinking because we've got all this teaching about the kingdom that just precedes what we're looking at now well and we do have one of the things with that assuming we have a close chronology here he was probably somewhat disappointed in Nazareth mm -hmm. these were his folks yeah and they didn't honor him at all yeah mm -hmm. and then he hears our Matthew records beheading of John that's another blow. Right. So then he he need he's just an I would think in his humanity he'd be really? Yeah. Yeah. So he needs yeah. to pray. It does so yeah. <laughs> the human is responding emotionally to difficult and tragic circumstances in relation to people who are close to him. Yeah. Yeah. But again, I don't think that's what, I don't think Matthew, if we, if we think of Matthew as projecting this picture on the wall, it's a moving picture. It's a living picture, but projecting a picture on the wall. I don't think right now he wants us to concentrate on Jesus emotional state. Mm -hmm. He's showing us, Something about kings and kingdoms. Okay, let's go on now with the feeding of the yeah. Oh my gosh, okay, three minutes. I got three minutes. I'm sorry. 
No, that's my fault because I got you rolling at the beginning. Oh, you did. You, you, it's, it's like what kids do to the teacher when they don't want to have to take the test. Oh, <laughs> come on. Okay. All right. Back to the, let, let, let me do this somewhat quickly. So back to the feeding of the 5,000. Look at the language that's used here. Verse 19, chapter 14, taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave it to the disciples and the disciples gave. There's 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 Eucharistic language here that, you know, Matthew probably wants us to notice. And there's also perhaps the echo of where this bread come from. It's like manna from heaven. I mean, it just appeared here. You know, so so again, the supernatural work through Jesus. This is God's work through Jesus. And it's God the king showing what his kingdom is like. In his kingdom, the people are cared for. They're not brutalized. They're not enslaved. They're not oppressed. This okay. king doesn't go around cutting off heads. Now, there's judgment, and the visions, the images related to judgment are frightening. But, okay, I'll stop with that. Why 12 baskets? It's a Jewish flock. <laughs> okay. okay, the nation, God's people, uh, everybody's taken care of. In God's kingdom, everybody's taken care of. Everybody's needs are met. Okay, we've been kind of touching on this. How does this event relate to the kingdom parables? Um, and, and I just want to, I'll, I'll just, uh, let me just close this down so I can see everybody. Uh, I think I think we get a really amazing picture of Jesus is really operating as king inside the territory of Herod the Tetrarch, even though for this moment he does leave. He, he'll leave in chapter 16. So I think it is true that Jesus is controlling the confrontation. He's in charge of this. It's coming, but he's not going to let it happen prematurely. Again, if we go to John chapter 6, that after the feeding of the 5,000 there, there's a group of people who want to take Jesus and make him king by force. Well, he's not going to let that happen. Because the big confrontation is yet to come. But here we have, as it were, under Herod's nose, Jesus acting like a king, showing people what God's kingdom or the kingdom of heaven is like, in clear contrast, I think Matthew is showing that Jesus is the absolute opposite contrast from earthly rulers in the way they throw their weight around, especially authoritarian king, you, you know, Roman Empire, Babylonian Empire. These kings, my word is the law and what, what I tell you to do, you're going to do. And if I decide you don't need to live anymore, then I've got the power to take care of that. Jesus is operating as king right under the earthly king's ruler's nose and establishing a vision of his kingdom among these people, his disciples and others who are listening in and maybe picking up on a little bit of what's going on. Now, later on, it will look like he's defeated, right? He's, he's killed by the Romans. Looks like he's defeated. But that was part of the plan, too. So I, I just thought, you, you know, um, uh, here in the middle of Matthew, sort of taking a little bit of a snapshot, but a bigger chunk of reading, we can start to see that these stories, sayings of Jesus, on the surface, they really look like they have almost nothing to do with each other. They We kind of jump from this thing to the next, but with a little time and thought and attention to detail, I think something does start to emerge that looks like the, the picture that I've been maybe trying to sketch a little bit here. This is, this is 
Jesus is operating like a king and he's doing it right under Herod's nose. And that it's not like any kingdom that we recognize on this earth. Pretty cool, I think. And uh, continuing to read and think and notice details. It's amazing what, what starts to happen. <laughs> All right, so we will not meet again until after Thanksgiving and Christmas, so look for a notice starting in January. In the meantime, happy Thanksgiving, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. Keep in touch. Okay. All right. God bless you.